This is going to be a video about setting up a top bar hive. This is Phil Chandler on a warm and sunny day after a week of rain. So this video is going to be about how I go about setting up a top bar hive. For those of you who haven't seen a top bar hive recently, this is the design I now prefer. Um, it comprises a long box, as you can see, a long sloped-sided Kenyan-style box. This box is approximately four feet long. In the bottom of it, we have a piece of guttering. And this is a uh, standard kind of industrial size. It's I think it's about um, six inches across, so 150 millimeters in new money. And as you can see, I have put into it a quantity of uh, wood chippy sort of material that's been lying around on the ground. This is um, like, like bags of wood chips that have been spread out on the ground for some months now and they have therefore picked up you know, various soil bacteria and um, animated little beings um, in, in this material. So that is to all intents and purposes a kind of mini ecosystem. Now this is what we call the eco floor and um, it's been the subject of some, I shall we say, controversy over the years. Um, and it's also been subject to a lot of experimentation um, on my part and on behalf of, uh, of several other people. And we have come to the conclusion that the biggest problem with an eco floor in a top bar hive is the fact that it seems to dry out rather quickly and thoroughly and therefore doesn't really support life in the, in the way in which we would like it to. However, we haven't got the design perfect yet, but it's what it does do very well is regulate the um, the airflow, if you like, at the bottom of the hive, and also it creates a layer of um, pretty substantial layer of in insulation at the bottom of the hive. So it seems to do a decent job of regulating the humidity in as much that it can this material will absorb um, excessive moisture. Uh, th this, currently this material is reasonably damp because it's been exposed to the rain for a week but um, it will it is absorbent of course uh, of moisture so it will tend to absorb excess moisture should there be any and it will act as a buffer uh, and release um, some of that moisture back into the hive in a regulated sort of way. Now the importance of that is that bees like to live in a reasonably humid environment but you, it doesn't want to be um, excessively humid. So the, the current um, research suggests that somewhere around 75% humidity is about right and so uh, that's what we're aiming for. <clears throat> Obviously we, without measuring equipment in here, um, we don't know that for sure but I have actually got a little device that will measure humidity. They're quite cheap to get hold of these days and I will be fitting one of those. So anyway, back to the, uh, the, back to the basic stuff. What we've got here um, is <clears throat> a hive with a hinge roof. Now I do recommend hinge roofs. They make life a lot easier when it comes to inspecting your bees. You don't want to have to lift off a heavy roof. Right here by the way in front of the hive is, um, is a little nuke and they're going into this hive shortly and I'll show you that happening. This stand uh, is, has been built specifically for this type of hive and it is standing on, in this particular case, it's standing on one of Brother Adam's original concrete plinths. So it's got a bit of a, a bit of a history to it as well. So we've got the hinge roof, we've got the sloping sides, we've got the floor material, um, the entrances. Uh, I've got one set of entrances here. This face is this is the entrance that the bees will be using in this particular case. There's another entrance which is tucked under here at the moment, uh, which I think you can see. Just it's kind of just below the level of the. Um, uh, guttering in this particular instance but that will be cut back so to make it clear won't be using that entrance this time but it's useful to have an extra entrance for various reasons including making splits can be can also be used for um, swarm control but that's a, perhaps for a later video right now what we're interested in is setting this thing up now you'll see that the what I've got in here is bare timber at the moment this is untreated Douglas fir. I use Douglas fir because it, it grows locally. I, there's a local sawmill that, that cuts it for me. It's about 22 mil, I think it's nominally 25, but it actually comes down to about 22 mil thick. 
so about three quarters of an inch thick and it's very stable it doesn't warp or twist or bend or do anything unpleasant it doesn't split so it's it's a good timber to use especially if you can't get hold of western red cedar which is probably the only the, the other material of choice um, and, and a third option i would say larch is probably okay as well anyway so we've got some bare timber here now there's two things you can do well there's obviously a lot more things than that but two things i would recommend that you do to the inside of a hive uh, this applies particularly to top bar hives but pretty much any wooden hive it's useful to do on um, one possible way of treating this inside here would be to varnish it using well what i use is a mixture of propolis and shellac now uh, propolis we all know is made from the resin of trees shellac is a substance made by the lac beetle which lives in Burma and Thailand places like that and it is farmed for shellac which was a very important material especially in the 19th century there's a whole industry in Birmingham based around shellac they used to make all kinds of things from it um, including of course the original recording uh, or, or not the original but the early um, recorded uh, music was done on shellac discs so it's a very versatile material it's the origin of our modern thermoplastics uh, and it's chemically very similar to propolis and it also dissolves in alcohol as does propolis so um, the two things combined make a very good varnish shellac of course you, otherwise you, you'll have heard it referred to as um, french polish when it's dissolved in methylated spirits so you can mix shellac and propolis together in the same solvent i.e alcohol a very strong it has to be a, a, a virtually uh, pure alcohol not just your, you know, a bottle of gin or something it has to be you know real <laughs> real alcohol um, and you just paint it on the inside as a varnish now the other thing you can do which is a uh, a, a trick i learned from studying some japanese videos um, is this process which is essentially scorching the woodwork with a blow lamp and as you can see i'm I'm using gas blow lamp, gas blow torch, or propane torch, the Americans call it, I think, and I'm scorching the wood such that it turns black, which is kind of what you expect when you scorch wood, really. So I'm going to do that all over. I'm going to make it darker than that, in fact. What that does is to, um, it, it creates a kind of sur surface waterproof surface um, on the wood and it and it stops it or should I say it reduces its permeability to water and it also acts as a, as a preservative and it's used widely in Japan it's a it's a method called shusugi ban uh, in Japanese they 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 use this a lot mostly on cedar uh, I think in fact I think in Japanese it means I think shusugi man means um, burnt cedar so what I'm doing is I'm scorching the surface with this blow lamp uh, in order to create a less permeable surface and one that the bees can, if they choose to, coat with propolis. So this is like an alternative to, to putting a propolis varnish in there, is actually preparing the surface for them. Um, what it does, it closes up the grain on the surface of the wood and uh, these seem to really like it. I mean, it's it's. You could say perhaps that there's a reason for that in in the sense that they often will have lived in um, hollows created by lightning strikes, so they're quite used to burnt wood, and perhaps it has benefits for them. I mean, obviously, for one point of view, it's uh, it's already sterilised, so uh, perhaps that makes it easier for them to deal with when they are when their attention is uh, how should we say focused elsewhere on getting food and stuff they don't have to worry about um, airborne pathogens or at least or, or wood borne um, timber borne pathogens uh, causing them a problem so there we go that's that's the sort of finish you're after or maybe that or maybe a little bit darker than that as you can see um, this is this is quite a nice thing to do also on the outside of the hive I, I do it quite quite routinely now on the outside of hives because it looks nice and um, you can on, as an external finish if you give it a coat or two of tongue oil that's t-u-n-g tongue oil um, which is the traditional Japanese uh, finish 
uh, it, it actually looks very nice and, and, it, and it, it weathers very well too. So that's another thought, rather than using something like linseed oil on the outside. Um, there's no actual real need to use anything on, on the outside, of course, if you don't want to, but this is a good um, option. So I'm just going to, I won't do the whole thing on camera because it's kind of not that exciting really, is it? Um, but you get the idea. As you can see, I've already uh, I've already treated the outside of this hive by the same method, and it does. As you can see, it has faded; it's gone a bit grey. But you can go over it again any time. Next, we're going to put the follower boards in. Now, these follower boards, also known as divider boards, their job is to. I'm actually going to swap those around. Their job is to contain the space in which the bees live. It, they are also there to make life easier for the beekeeper, it has to be said. Their job is, um, at least in part, to make it very easy for you to get in and check your colony. And you'll see how that works in a moment when I've got the bees in here. Um, in this case, I've had to modify the bottom of the board slightly to fit into the trough um, that contains the the wood chips and this one on my this this hand here isn't a, isn't a great fit I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of mod on that but that's okay these should be reasonably B tight but they don't have to be 100% B tight it's not it's not vital um, it helps if they are they are reasonably B tight though so now we've got a space in between these two followers into which we can put our bees and our bees are ready to go so I'm going to get the nuke box um, from the front here and we're going to put the bees into their new home. Now what I've done in the meantime um, is for about 10 days prior to this I've had the nuke box on this stand with its entrance exactly where this entrance is so the bees should theoretically be reasonably well orientated to this hive already and that's that's quite an important thing to do because it makes it much easier for you to get your bees in and, and feeling at home when they already know where the entrance is. So um, here's my nuke with the bees in it and I can show you the bees in it by just lifting up one of these bars and here are the bees. And I'm just going to take this first bar carefully. These guys have been in here for um, something like a week, maybe just over a week, building comb. And I'm just going to very carefully place each of these bars in turn. And they have, I'm pleased to say, they have conveniently built one comb per bar as instructed which makes life a lot easier for me of course when I come to transfer them if they were cross combed at this point then we'd be in trouble so I'm just going to transfer these across I'm doing this one handed of course at the moment and I will be having to use a, a water spray probably to get their heads down I might I might be able to get away with it without. The important thing here is just to kind of work smoothly and just let the bees kind of, well, settle in I suppose, just don't do, any, don't do anything suddenly. Um, if you saw the video of me collecting this swarm, you'll have seen that I, I actually put in into the box um, quite a lot of foliage. So I'm just going to, actually I might just leave that in the bottom of the hive anyway, because I seem to like it. So we can take these and I'll shake that enough. 
we can gently take out these little branches just drop them in the bottom there this is um, I think this is it's pretty sure this is a Leylandii um, cypress so it's quite resinous and maybe maybe there's something in that that the bees like I certainly don't see, show any signs of uh, wanting to leave it so there's, there's a bunch of bees in the box here of course and also mm -hmm. A wasp which is getting beaten up near the bottom there has just fallen to the floor um, obviously he made the mistake of uh, trying to muscle in on the bees territory so okay so again I'm working single one-handed so it isn't ideal but what I'm going to do is just turn this upside down you can see uh, bees in the box turning this upside down a few taps that's, um, that's one of my early bars there that's a narrow bar so I'm not going to use that I'm going to shake the bees off it All my, be all my bars now are 38 millimeters wide, that's my standard. Um, it works well for me, uh, it, it may well work for you, or it possibly might not, and that's something you'll have to experiment with, but 38 mil works very well for me. Okay, there's a lot of bees in there. I'm going to use this as a brush and just kind of nudge some of these guys into the hive. If I was doing this with both hands, I'd probably mostly just knock the bees in to be honest but you can use a brush if you do use a brush um, a goose feather is good in this case I'm using a, a little piece of Leylandii and that seems to be doing okay so um, short of uh, just tidying this up um, that's pretty much the job done. I'm going to move that follower board in of course. I'm going to give them a, another bar probably each end. I'm also going to give them some fondant because they're probably quite hungry. I gave them some a week ago when I moved in so I'm just going to put some of that on the floor to keep them topped up because it's a small colony. <laughs> they're building comb. Uh, they need all the help they can get quite honestly. So I'm just going to dust these guys with uh, a fine mist of water containing a few drops of peppermint oil which is my favourite way of um, just chasing them down. <clears throat> the purpose of using a mist spray like this is just simply to get their heads down so it's just a signal to them that it's probably going to be more comfortable indoors than out and uh, you can just nudge the last guys in there they're, si they're signaling of course at the moment they're fanning with their Nazanov glands just to make sure that nobody gets lost I'm going to add another empty bar this end like that now I perhaps you should have mentioned that it's important uh, in this way of doing things to leave a gap between the, this follower board and the end of the hive okay the purpose of that gap is uh, well there are several purposes one is so that you can put a feeder in there should you need to and to do that of course you would need a, ho a hole through the follower board most of my follower boards have holes this one doesn't but it will so there will be a hole drilled down there, there will be a plate put in up here with, with, with holes in it and I can invert jars of food over there if I need to or I can put fondant in there if I need to. Okay, so that's one reason. Another reason is that it keeps the bees away from the end of the hive so it effectively acts as an extra insulating buffer in the winter and uh, I think that's important you know we, we do all we can to keep the bees um, cozy so uh, one way is, is to leave an air gap you can of course fill that gap with something in the winter and I have been known to fill that with straw and I think that's also a good idea 
over here we've got a bunch of bees just kind of just going to nudge them along a little bit because we want them to join their mates which they will do I'm just going to let them take their time I'm not going to rush them uh, you can see down there that the bees are, are walking in to the, to the other part where they're already building comb um, so this follow board here is the one that's going to move this is the one that is going to allow them to expand in this direction and we can keep adding top bars in here um, as required as, as the bees require to expand we can simply add top bars like this these guys are going to take a while before they need you know even the bars that I've put in here so far but you know one day they will one day they'll need more space and then we can simply add more bars move this follower along dead easy now what's going to happen is that the because this end is nearest the entrance this is where the brood is going to be this is the, the where the where the queen's going to be laying eggs the brood nest is going to be towards this end of the hive this end of the hive is going to be where they store honey so we've got to make sure at all times that they have space for the queen to lay eggs and we also need uh, space for them to store honey so those two things have to be kept an eye on and using this system with the two follower boards um, I call it the tandem follower board system, whatever, um, call it what you like. Using this system it's very easy at any point to come along and just check both ends of the hive because all you've got to do is come to this end and move this follower board away just quickly like this and you can see exactly what's going on down there. Okay, make sure that the bees are doing what they're supposed to be doing down there. You can pull away a couple more bars to, to check the brood if you need to. And then when you, once you're happy with the with the brood nest end of the hive, you can come up the other end of the hive and you can take this one away and you can check their stores, check their honey stores. And so this tandem system is really efficient, really effective. It's um, easy to use. It's, it's gentle on the bees because you only spend a very short amount of time um, actually in the hive disturbing them. Because you're coming into the end of the, of, the, of the hive rather than coming down from the top, you're never exposing all of these at once to a drop in temperature, which you would be doing, of course, otherwise. At any time in this country, um, any day you care to, <laughs> care to inspect your bees is going to be cooler than the temperature of the, of the brood nest, which is, of course, 35 degrees centigrade. We get virtually zero days in, in the UK where it's 35 degrees centigrade. Obviously, in countries like, well, let's say the southern states of the USA, so, you know, Texas, Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, across there, where they routinely have days um, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or over, uh, what would that be, over, over 40 degrees centigrade, um, then you've got, you've got the opposite problem because um, you don't want to you want to try and stop heat getting into the hive This is why insulation is important whether you're in a hot country or in a cold country You're trying to do the same thing you, what you're trying to do is maintain or rather You're trying to help the bees maintain the temperature and humidity inside the hive that they prefer Okay, you're not trying to keep them warm as such You're not you know, but you are trying to keep them um, you're trying to make it easy for them to maintain their own temperature okay let's put it that way so you must have insulation on top of the bars all the time under the roof so this roof here is made from a phenolic ply it's black it does get warm heat does come through it and so we want to keep that heat out of the hive if you were in a hot country that would get even hotter and more heat would come through and you could be in danger of causing your combs to collapse simply from the temperature that you're exposing your bees to so therefore you must be careful at all times to do your best to keep the, the bees or maintain help the bees maintain the temperature that they want which is 35 degrees centigrade or 95 degrees fahrenheit inside the brood nest do that by putting insulation above them okay that's the, the critical thing keep insulation above them under the roof if you have a reflective roof, so let's say you have a metal roof um, which reflects heat, but of course metal also transmits heat, so a metal roof will transmit heat um, through into this cavity as well. So again, insulation, very important. So what have we got? Now the bees, as I said before, are already um, orientated to this spot, and you can see at the entrance there, there are bees who have already figured out where the entrance is and so they will simply return to the same spot that they've been used to 
coming back to and all will be well and that's pretty much it that's all you have to do and the one thing I haven't done yet is to feed these guys so I'll be doing that in a moment and also I've got a whole bunch of bees uh, still in this new box I've got to shake those out but I'll do that off camera so that's how I set up a top bar hive how you do it of course is up to you but I, I've tested this method over well I suppose something like 15 years now um, I've been using top bar hives for about 20 years but um, using this tandem method uh, and this hive design or something close to it for about 10 to 15 years and um, I can say you know conclusively that this this design works um, other designs of course um, have their merits as well and um, some of them work pretty well too um, so leave your comments below if you have any and I will see you in the next video